Welcome to EduPlanet 21's 10 Minute Tuesdays, a series of conversations with experts in education. We continue to speak with our PLUS content authors um, to provide educators with actionable information in bite-sized pieces. My name is Claire Coop scott and I'm with the content team at EduPlanet 21. Today, I am joined by Allison Zamuda, an education consultant and the author of Students at the Center, Personalized Learning and Habits of Mind as well as Benna Kalik, co-director of the Institute for Habits of Mind and chief strategic advisor at EduPlanet 21. Allison and Benna, welcome to 10 Minute Tuesdays. Thank you. And Benna was my co-collaborator on that book as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so what we'd like to do um, is uh, talk with you just about personalized learning. And in this first conversation, what I hoped we do is kind of cover some of the basics. Um, so we know that personalized learning is a hot topic in education today, um, and different people have different uh, definitions of what personalized learning is. So I'd love to hear from you two, the experts, how you define personalized learning. So personalized learning in our minds is a way of engaging the learner in the experience itself. So the basic definition that we typically use is that it is designed to be um, rigorous, relevant, and meaningful. And we're trying to do that in, in consideration of the very real challenges and expectations that the curriculum lays out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting also, I would back off from thinking of us as experts. We're experts in the definition that we had. <laughs> yeah. But that they're really, one of the things that's interesting about personalized learning right now is that everybody has a different picture in their heads and that there's a lot more misunderstanding than understanding. So we try to be as clear as possible that our work, when you're reading our work and when you're learning with us, that it is really grounded in a definition that we continue to refer to. And it's a very humanistic one. Yes. And so often what we find is that when people think of personalized learning, they immediately think, oh, it's an IEP for every kid. But that's not really what it's about, although that's not a terrible thing. But it's really about how do you really build very good relationships with kids so that you know how to really help them find their way to learning and also find their way to who they are in this world and who they would like to be. So one of the easier frames that Ben and I created very early on was the idea of the four filters of personalized learning. And the idea of thinking through that, you can begin to imagine transforming a learning activity, a unit, a project, um, thinking through those four filters. So you wanna talk about the four filters together? Yeah, so, so um, she's giving me the first one, which is about voice. <laughs> so anyway, one of, one of the uh, filters that we talk about is voice. And it's not necessarily in any order, but what we're saying is that if you walk into a personalized learning classroom, you are gonna see a lot of active voice. You're gonna see kids participating. You're gonna see a lot of engagement. You're gonna see a lot of students feeling that they are not only able to give their perspective, but that they're also very skillful in being able to understand the perspective of others. And that actually leads nicely into co-creation. So initially, as personalized learning began to evolve about 10 years ago, it started with the moniker of voice and choice. And we prefer to use the language or the vocabulary co-creation because the idea of students having a stake in the design of their experiences, as opposed to choice, which is having students select from a pre-authorized list. And then we also talk about the idea of social construction. And what we mean by that is the students begin to realize where expertise is, both in the class and outside of the class and they build networks and they begin to understand how they can reach out through Skype or other matters to people from all over the world. But equally important, they can reach out to the students who are sitting right next to them and recognize that that peer interaction could mean a lot to them in terms of the development of their ideas. And part of social construction too is that you're starting to see this important dynamic. So it's not just the stepping out and seeking out information and ideas. 
but you're then actually doing something with the, those information and ideas, and you're adding that value back into the world. So it's this interesting dynamic of both information seeker, but also creator as part of social construction. And the last is self-discovery. It's really starting to have kids become much more deeply engaged and thoughtful on what am I learning through this experience? It's not just learning about the knowledge that I've continued to acquire. It's also understanding myself better, starting to think about in what ways has my point of view broadened a little bit or deepened a little bit, or in what ways have I found a particular um, topic or issue or strategy problematic? To what extent can I actually identify progress? So all of that is in the last territory of self-discovery. And when you think about that, what it really could lead to very easily, and we see this very often happening, especially in secondary, which is it's the beginning of a student writing a resume about himself yeah. because he's really able to say not only what he knows about himself, but what he knows about himself as a learner, what he knows what he does well, what he knows how he does when he doesn't do well, and how he accepts feedback and what he does with it. So all of those very incredibly important skills that we keep hearing from the World Economic Forum are so important for career as well as for college that they're really beginning to have that sense of themselves because the emphasis has been put on knowing yourself is a part of being a good learner. So Allison, going back to, you said something about where personalized learning was when it started 10 years ago. So can you talk a little bit about where you've seen it come in the last 10 years and where maybe you think it's going in the next five to 10? <laughs> that's right. In, in the next three and a half minutes. <laughs> so that, that's a, a pretty big question. So let's do a quick review when personalized learning um, came onto the scene. And again, it's about 10 years ago. Um, there were two things that really distinguished it. First, it is the idea of voice and choice. And when you're starting to think about voice and choice, it, it started to become a bit problematic because voice and choice started to feel a lot like differentiation. So one of the things that Ben and I talk with um, folks on that we're working with in schools is what's the distinction between differentiation and personalizing? And that's really why we spend a fair bit of time and attention on the idea of co-creation. The second part is that um, the immediate moniker that showed up 10 years ago is that learning can happen anywhere, anytime. The notion of it being a 24 seven learning experience. And again, it, it does play out in the idea of the distinction between personalized learning and individualization. So just because um, we're trying to continue to personalize doesn't mean that this is a technology move in and of itself. So the interesting part in terms of where it started 10 years ago, we're pretty much still in the thick of it right now, of really trying to hone in and think through how can personalizing be um, engaged in as humanistic, joyful, rich, deep, meaningful experience. And those experiences are really, um, again, fundamentally putting students at the center and using them as, again, the most untapped resource right now we have in our classrooms. But one of the things we like to do is leave our viewers or our listeners with some you know, nuggets of information or quick tips so they are either beginning their personalized learning journey or they are in the middle of it, what are some things that they could do to get started or how they could learn more about personalized learning? Well, one, one tip that we can leave them with particularly is the very beginning of it all, which is building relationships. Because in the absence of relationships, you really don't know the kids and knowing the kids well has a lot to do with how it works. So it doesn't mean though, and this is something that we found very interesting, is it doesn't mean a lot of team building and rah rah and let's have lots of activities. It does mean that when you do things, you do them purposefully to help kids learn how to be thinking more interdependently, learning how to really be working with one another and hearing one another's point of view. So a debate can be relationship building if in fact what you're doing is you're finding out issues that kids are really interested in. And I would say, for example, uh, a lot of issues the kids are interested in 
come from questions that they're asking, something that really matters to them, and then having taking different perspectives on it. So there's a lot of ways of doing it, but the relationship building is in the service of learning. It isn't just relationship building, and now we'll do our math. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining me today, and I'm looking forward to some further conversations with you uh, about personalized learning.